Hello everyone! There are many reasons why infectious mononucleosis or mono has such a bad reputation. With huge swollen lymph nodes, a swollen spleen and a protracted fever, it can look much like lymphoma. It can be pretty difficult to tell the two apart. The tonsils can swell so much that it can be hard for the patient to swallow liquid, so they can become dehydrated. In extreme cases, the tonsils may even compromise the airway. And we've all heard of young and otherwise healthy athletes who needed many months to get fully into shape after a bout of mono due to prolonged fatigue. So in this video I'm going to show you when to suspect infectious mononucleosis, how to confirm it with tests, how to tell it apart from other conditions and what can you expect from it, how it will typically progress and what can be done about it. Infectious mononucleosis is caused by EBV, the Epstein-Barr virus, a member of the herpes virus family. Most people will get infected with this virus at some point in their lives. In most cases, this happens already in childhood, which is good news because in about 90% of children, this infection is asymptomatic or it looks like another insignificant viral infection that kids get all the time. The people who are unlucky enough to first come into contact with this virus in adolescence or adulthood are much more likely to end up with a full-blown clinical picture of infectious mononucleosis. And mono is not called the kissing disease for nothing, it's transmitted through saliva. And this is probably one of the reasons why kids are so good at transmitting it. One licks a toy, then another one, then ten of them, then they wipe their noses, their snot, their saliva with their hands, then they touch another toy or someone else's face, you get the picture. The trouble is that once someone is infected, they keep shedding the virus for six months, maybe even a year or longer than that. And to make matters worse, even afterwards, they will intermittently shed the virus, perhaps for decades. On top of that, the incubation period is also quite long, between four and eight weeks. So most people who get infected have absolutely no idea where they got it from. Once a person is infected, the virus enters the epithelial cells in the oropharynx, so in the throat. There it multiplies and infects its main target, B lymphocytes. And since B lymphocytes circulate all over the lymphatic system, this makes it very easy for the virus to spread wherever there is lymphatic tissue, to all sorts of lymph nodes, to the tonsils, to the liver and the spleen. But the most severely hit will be the lymphatic tissue adjacent to the oropharynx, meaning the tonsils and the lymph nodes in the neck. So it comes as no surprise that most patients with infectious mononucleosis will have very impressive tonsillopharyngitis with huge, painful, swollen tonsils filled to the brim with exudate, meaning dead cells. So it will look much like strep throat. But in addition to having swollen anterior cervical nodes like in strep throat, patients with mono will also have enlarged lymph nodes in all regions of the neck behind sternoclavicomastoid muscle as well. Other lymph nodes in other regions of the body can be swollen too, but usually they will not be as impressive as the lymph nodes in the neck. The liver and the spleen will often also be enlarged, usually with signs of mild hepatitis. But let's go back to B lymphocytes for a second. Infected B cells become activated, transformed and they begin to multiply and produce a wide array of antibodies. Now most of these antibodies will cause absolutely no problems, but sometimes they may bind to erythrocytes, platelets and leukocytes and lead to their destruction. Some of these antibodies will actually bind to antigens found in other species and we can use this to diagnose infectious mononucleosis. These are called heterophile antibodies, but more on that later. To put a stop to this infection and the uncontrolled activation and proliferation of B cells, the immune system will activate all sorts of responders, most notably CD8 cytotoxic T cells to wipe out the infected B lymphocytes. And all of this will result in lymphocytosis, an elevated concentration of all sorts of lymphocytes in the bloodstream, both B and T cells. And as the time passes, more and more cells in the patient's bloodstream will be these activated T cells that target infected B cells. And we call these activated T cells atypical lymphocytes because of their distinctive appearance. They kind of look like monocytes. And actually, this is how this disease got its name, infectious mononucleosis. These mononuclear cells that look like monocytes are actually activated T cells. And they will wipe out 
most of the infected B cells, but some will remain. And this is how EBV establishes a lifelong latent infection, which is quite characteristic for herpes viruses, right? And occasionally it can reactivate and this causes this intermittent shedding of the virus in the patient's saliva. And with this picture in mind, I hope it's much easier to understand when to suspect and how to diagnose infectious mononucleosis. Usually you will suspect mono when you see a teenager or a young adult with tonsillopharyngitis and impressive lymphadenopathy involving the neck. What sets infectious mononucleosis apart from other causes of tonsillopharyngitis like strep throat is the gradual onset of symptoms and fatigue. So many patients report this incredibly severe fatigue that can last for, well, weeks, sometimes even months. Another thing that sets it apart from most viral causes of tonsillitis is that EBV does not infect the respiratory epithelium. Therefore, there will be no coryza or coughing as opposed to tonsillopharyngitis caused by adenovirus, for example. Now, some patients with mono may report that their nose is blocked, but this is not due to a swollen respiratory mucosa or secretions. This is because the tonsils are so swollen that they partially obstruct the nasopharynx. Now, in routine lab tests in infectious mononucleosis, usually you will see lymphocytosis, and if your analyzer can detect atypical lymphocytes, you should see more than 10% of atypical lymphocytes. Remember, these are these activated CD8 T cells. In early days of infection, this may not be all that clear. Lymphocytosis may not be all that pronounced, but usually after several days or a week, you should see these typical findings. If you have biochemical tests available, you will see that ALT and AST are also elevated, perhaps several hundred units per liter. The highest I've seen personally was uh, 900 units per liter for ALT, right? LDH is usually elevated as well due to widespread destruction of lymphocytes and other cells. And okay, let's suppose that now you want to prove that this is infectious mononucleosis caused by EBV. How you do that depends on what kind of tests are available. In Croatia, we have specific serologic tests for EBV. In early infection, the first antibodies that become positive are the antibodies directed against BCA, the viral capsid antigen, both IgM and IgG antibodies. Now, IgM antibodies will persist for a couple of months, while IgG will persist for life. So the presence of IgM antibodies directed against BCA is a very reliable marker of acute infection. On the other hand, after several months, EBNA antibodies, so antibodies directed against Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen will become positive. But again, this will take several months. So in acute infection, these antibodies should be negative. So if your patient presents with something that looks like infectious mononucleosis, you order serology and you find that anti-EBNA antibodies are positive, this effectively excludes infectious mononucleosis as the cause of your patient's symptoms. Because again, it takes a long time for these antibodies to appear, meaning your patient was in fact infected with EBV, but this happened a long time ago. Therefore, their acute symptoms are not caused by EBV infection. There are also some other antibodies, but if you know about IgM, VCA, and EBNA, this is more than enough in the vast majority of cases. In some countries, they don't use specific serologic tests for EBV, they use heterophile antibody tests instead. Remember that EBV infects B lymphocytes, they, pro they produce all sorts of antibodies, and some of these antibodies are heterophile antibodies, meaning they bind to antigens found on erythrocytes from other species, like horse erythrocytes or sheep erythrocytes. And this is the basis for these tests. In proper context, these tests are very reliable, but there are certain problems. In the very early days of infection, the sensitivity of these tests is not perfect. It's only around 70%. So if your patient does have very convincing symptoms of infectious mononucleosis, but the first test comes back negative, you can repeat it in a couple of weeks and then it should really be positive. On top of that, these tests are not very sensitive, not very reliable in children under 4. 
they can be falsely positive in some other conditions like lymphoma or HIV infection, but this is really rare. So if you have the typical symptoms of infectious mononucleosis and the positive heterophile test, this is infectious mononucleosis. In fact, these tests are so reliable that if your patient with mononucleosis-like symptoms has a negative heterophile antibody test and several weeks have passed, okay, you should seriously consider other potential causes of their symptoms, and especially if they don't have tonsillopharyngitis. I emphasize this for several reasons. Number one, there are many dangerous conditions that can present with lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly or a prolonged fever, like hematologic malignancies, lymphoma and leukemia. If you've seen my videos before, you will know that HIV, acute HIV infection, can present with mononucleosis-like symptoms. And there are some things that you need to know in order to notice that something is off. For example, if your analyzer detected lymphocytosis with a lot of atypical lymphocytes, but you are not actually convinced that this is infectious mononucleosis, have a cytologist or a pathologist take a look at the peripheral blood smear because automatic analyzers may not be able to tell the difference between atypical lymphocytes and blasts. In acute HIV infection, there are also several elements that can help you tell it apart from your garden variety EBV infectious mononucleosis. Patients with acute HIV infection often complain of weight loss or diarrhea, generalized rash or oral ulcers. None of these findings are very common in Epstein-Barr infectious mononucleosis. Now, okay, some patients with infectious mononucleosis may have a generalized rash, usually after exposure to antibiotics. So, usually someone misdiagnoses their tonsillopharyngitis as strep throat, they are given amoxicillin, and as a result of this, they develop this rash. But generally speaking, it's not as common as in HIV. In HIV, generalized rash is practically an integral part of the, the clinical presentation. There is another more benign cause of something that kind of looks like infectious mononucleosis, acute CMV infection, another herpes virus, by the way. Most of my patients were people in their 30s or 40s, and most of them had small children, and this is probably how they got infected. Now, these patients will have a prolonged fever, which could be quite high, but not much else. They don't have tonsillopharyngitis, and maybe you will see lymphocytosis, maybe you won't. Usually, you will see slightly elevated liver function tests, so ALT and AST once again. So, it can be quite difficult to suspect that this is CMV, but hopefully, the next time you see something like that, you will remember to test for that. As for the treatment of infectious mononucleosis, well, quite simply, it doesn't exist. Fortunately, most of the time, this is a benign, self-limited condition and the patients just need to wait it out. Serious complications are really uncommon. The most common reason for hospitalization in infectious mononucleosis is dehydration due to severe tonsillopharyngitis. I've seen many patients who are unable to drink fluid, so of course they need to, needed to be hospitalized for a short while, or sometimes they were afraid that their tonsils will actually obstruct their airway, and in these cases a short course of corticosteroids were generally helpful. Now we used to recommend all patients with infectious mononucleosis to stick to the so-called liver sparing or liver friendly diet or whatever and while yes there is mild hepatitis in infectious mononucleosis there is absolutely no proof that you should stick to a specific diet now of course it's not a good idea to have whiskey and hamburgers for breakfast it, it's never a good idea to do that actually but again there is no proof that there is a specific diet that makes it all better it's uh, it's self-limited regardless but the big question is, when should patients return to work or to sports? Well, as soon as their temperature normalizes and they feel fit enough to go to school or to the office, they can go. But when it comes to strenuous physical activities, contact sports and anything that increases the intra-abdominal pressure, most experts would recommend that they should wait for a minimum of four weeks, sometimes even longer than that. Unfortunately, a small percentage of patients will continue to experience debilitating fatigue for months, in rare cases, maybe even years. We don't know why this happens, we don't know how to treat it, how to deal with it, but the good news is, eventually, things will get better, but they might take a lot of time. 
If you feel like you learned something useful today, please share this video with your colleagues and students and anyone who you think might benefit from it. And take a look at the videos that are related to this topic, like the ones on acute HIV infection and lymphadenopathy. Thank you for watching, good luck out there and take care.